A radical look at Scottish history with Stuart McHardy. Part 1. History and Story. There's an old cliche that says it's the winners that write history. And it's true. The thing is, though, that people, even those defeated in battle and war, continue to tell stories about what happened in their lives. Stories can give a totally different slant on what we think history is, and my understanding of Scotland's past has changed greatly since I began to understand this. One of the biggest problems is that the history that is written in the books has for far too long simply been about big men doing big things. And until very recently, the only time you ever found women in history was when it was folk like Mary Queen of Scots, Elizabeth of England, or Catherine the Great of Russia. Women who were effectively doing a man's job because there was no man available. Half of the entire human race has been seen as being essentially unimportant in history. And this concentration of big men doing big things means that they have become seen as the only ones worth noticing in our past. Now this is a handy way of thinking for folk that think everything should be about the elites anyway. And the emphasis on what is considered elite behaviour has coloured an awful lot of archaeology. It's as if the only people of importance in the human story are kings and generals, priests and the rich. Well, in the course of these broadcasts, I'll be taking another approach to trying to understand the past, my past and yours. And it's worth remembering the very act of being alive means that you have as long a pedigree as any Toth. It's just that your ancestors have been left out of the books. It's also undeniable that writing is a relatively new phenomenon in the human story, first appearing in the Middle East, it is said, about 5,000 years ago. Now, modern humans have been around getting on for a quarter of a million years, so for most of our time on Earth, knowledge has been passed on through the spoken word. And this is almost certainly true of earlier forms of humans as well, like the Neanderthal. Work done in Australia in the 1970s showed that some of the indigenous Dreamtime stories went back 30 to 40,000 years, referring to giant marsupials that have been extinct since then. My own research into the phenomenon of the Nine Maidens traditions suggests that the underlying legend may well have come out of Africa when people first left there 70 or 80,000 years ago. And the stories have survived. The idea that oral traditions cannot be trusted is directly contradicted by storytelling traditions in societies across our planet. We we'll have to be careful, though. We we'll have to be critical of story just as we have to be critical of history. And today I want to look at what I believe is a truly ancient story that is at the heart of who we in Scotland think we are. First, though, we have to be aware that all written history is written to an agenda whether deliberate or not. All of our oldest histories were written by people who were educating a system that was Christian to its core. From the time that writing arrived here with the Christian religion, it was effectively the preserve of priests. Go check. All our early historians were men of the cloth, and their loyalty, first and foremost, was their God and their religion. At the core of this was the idea that the Bible was the actual word of God, and from this grew a reverential attitude towards the written word, which is actually no very healthy. It's not just priests, though, that write way an agenda. All historians do, me included. The idea that we can be objective and consider in the past doesn't really stand up to much consideration. Just think of how differently British and French history has seen Napoleon Bonaparte. Now, I'm not saying we should just reject history because, oh, bias in any particular writer or group of writers, simply that we should be aware of what agenda or set of beliefs lies behind the creation of any historical work. Over the coming weeks we'll look at particular instances of how stories can alter and improve our understanding of our nations and our people's past. But first I want to look at what is one of our oldest tales that could only have survived through oral transmission. This story is in the 1320 Declaration of Arbroath, dressed up in biblical references because of contemporary cultural parameters. This particular tale appears to go back a very long time indeed, to a time thousands of years before Christianity was even thought of. 
It is the story of the Scots, said to be descendants of Scota, herself the daughter of the Pharaoh, who are said to have come from Egypt, then on to Iberia, then on to Ireland, and then Scotland. Well, as we'll see, the notion of the Scots having arrived here from Ireland around the year 500 has little, if anything, to support it, other than a single written source from beyond our borders. But the rest of the Scots' supposed journey is intriguing indeed. Modern genetics and anthropology have led to the understanding that humans spread out from Africa more than 80,000 years ago. Scota is said to have come from Egypt. After the last ice age, when the glaciers faded away, the first humans who came into this part of the world came from what is now northern Spain, in Iberia. Here, at the heart of our most important historical document, created as part of the process of resistance against an invader for the south, we have what I believe is a very old story indeed. It is presented in the form that draws on the literate Christian traditions of the time, but it could well be a remembrance of ancient origins that have been told and retold here since humans first arrived at least 14,000 years ago. The Shenikes and tradition bearers of the early clans and the tribes that preceded them were an integral part of society, and in pre-literate times such people were trained to use their memories prodigiously. People's origin myths are not Chinese whispers. Now, the influence of the Christian Bible on all our early histories is obvious and is accompanied by other conventions, which have also no served our history well. Because of the nature of the Christian Church, the classical historian Mary Beard referred to it as the Roman Empire Mark II, the education systems of most of Europe were not just based on, but biased towards the literary traditions of Rome and Greece. It's important to understand that saying this is not necessarily a criticism of those historians who were raised to see the world in such a Christian and Mediterranean-centric fashion. It is simply to note that such attitudes colour how our history has been given to us. As we shall see when we look at Scotland's megalithic past, the idea that we were at the end of the world awaiting enlightenment from the south is a ridiculous concept, but one that has surfaced all too often in how we are asked to look at ourselves. Today, formal education is absolutely rooted in literacy, but it's not the only education. All sorts of occupations still depend on young people being told and shown how to do various tasks. Fishermen still need to learn to read the sea, just as farmers have to understand the seasons and how crops grow. And in the far past, such processes were much more widespread. And underpinning all of this is the spoken word. When children first start to try and speak, we say things like, Go on, tell us a story, or that's a good story. And as the children grow, we tell them stories and sing them songs to help them sleep, exactly as our ancestors have been doing for tens of thousands of years. That has not changed. You know, nowadays storytellers are seen as entertainers. For a very long time, indeed, they were also the educators. And many of the stories they have handed down still have much to tell us. Next time we'll look at early society and the building of the megaliths and their stories. Further information can be found at www.stuartmcharmody.com wordpress.com